Hello and welcome to The Week in the Wild, a new video series from theweek.co.uk and Nat Geo Wild. I'm Ollie Mann, you'd usually find me presenting The Week Unwrapped, everyone's favourite current affairs podcast. But today things are a little different, as you can see. We are in glorious Technicolor vision. To celebrate Joel Satore's groundbreaking documentary series, Photo Arc, in which he takes some amazing photos of endangered species before they disappear. So let's talk about a scary idea, mass extinction. 99% of all species which have ever lived on Earth are now extinct. There are still over a trillion species still kicking around today, but which are most at risk and what is being done to protect them? Well, to enlighten us is our expert panel. Adrian Kale is a cameraman producing natural history programs for the BBC, ITV, as well as National Geographic. Benedict Allen is a real 21st century explorer documenting his travels as he goes. Uh, Dr. Nisha Owen runs the Edge of Existence program looking into threatened species around the world. Craig Jones is a professional wildlife photographer and Will Burrard Lucas is a wildlife photographer too, although Will, you specialise in using high-tech gadgets to get super close to your subjects. So Joel Satore talks in Photo Arc about how he wants to document all of these species because he's aware that their existence is in peril. Is that something that you think about as well when you're taking your pictures? I've photographed many animals and tigers, for an example, and several of them have gone extinct, poached in that time. So there are memories of pictures and emotive issues here, yeah, but instantly you don't think, is that going to be a lie because it's part of the, the whole system that I'm in? But on reflection, Ali, yeah, you do, you do think that, yes. And, and for you, Will, when you're trying to connect with an animal to get it to connect with an audience, what are the tricks, I guess? How do you make sure the audience relate to it like you do? Either it's a moment of expression or eye contact or, or a particular perspective that, that shows them something different. Um, or even the creature itself, you know, finding a magnificent bull elephant, the likes which people haven't maybe seen before. Or a, even a tiny little chameleon maybe that uh, people see that and you know, can't believe how small that animal is. Trying to show people that something that, you know, they don't just scroll past straight away on their social media feed, something that does make them stop and actually look at that animal and relate to it in some way. And in terms of photographic techniques then, I was mentioning in the intro how you innovate on that. Uh, I mean, what Joel Satore's done in his photo arc is, is put all the animals on either a black or a white yeah. background. It's a very simple idea, yeah. but it's also not entirely natural because he's taking them out of their environment, putting them in front of something. Is that a good way to reach people? What he's done by removing all of the environment around them is it just leaves the animal there. And so I think when you look at those pictures, you know, you, you connect with that animal, you see that animal. Hopefully that inspires people to think about these animals, care about them, maybe want to conserve them in some way. There's something a bit anthropomorphic going on very often, isn't there? When people say they want to document nature, but actually they're trying to inspire the viewer to feel a connection. And sometimes that means playing up almost human traits. Well, I think, you know, human traits in in anything that you're filming or, or photographing are, are in the eye of the beholder. But if you're using those human values to help instill fact and passion and love for these creatures and to help them survive, then it's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, so what's a human value that you well, see well, in well, a picture well, of a mamazette? Well, mama's drama. A mother feeding its babies, the battle to survive, the battle between predator and prey. All of these things we could associate with daily life struggles. Okay, Nisha, I want to talk to you about mass extinction and how close do you think we are to it? The science is pretty clear on mass extinctions at the moment. So we know that there's been five mass extinctions in the past. And there's been quite a few papers recently, particularly in Nature and Science, that acknowledge that we are actually in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. And now this is very much being caused by humanity. So previously, these extinctions happened over a really, really long period of time, so geological, millions of years. And now we're finding that we are accelerating the rate of extinction of species astronomically, so more than 100 times the natural background rate. So in the past, you would find that one species might go extinct every 5,000 years. But since the 1500s, we've lost more than 70 mammals, more than 140 birds, more than 30 amphibians. And those are only the species we know about. So there's going to be many more species that we, we didn't even discover and which are lost to us now. And is that link between human-made causes and what's happening crystal clear? Because we weren't documenting it before, where we don't know how many species there were that 
expired. Absolutely. Um, because it's happened so recently, so in the, only in the last five or six hundred years, it is very much down to what we've been doing. So we are clearing habitats, we're degrading habitats, we are hunting species, we're over-exploiting them, um, we are causing things such as climate change. Um, so there's a lot of things that are changing the natural world and the natural balance of things. And is that something that you've actually seen in your own travels, Benedict? As you've gone around the world, can you see the change? No, I suppose my sp perspective is, is slightly different. I've, as an, a so-called explorer, adventurer, I've gone to local communities and live with them. And I've seen those habitats or those ecosystems being corroded over the years. And the consequence of that is very, very clear if you're living with these remote people because they disappear, they dissipate because that place that was a provider is no longer a provider. But Nisha, you are a conservationist. How much of your work does actually rely on native people? Fundamentally, we need to be working on the ground with local communities. Um, they're the ones that are coexisting with wildlife. They're the ones that we need to um, work with to ensure that we can reduce things like um, poaching and hunting and other threats. But we mustn't forget that fundamentally, many of the threats that these species face are driven by Western consumers and Western consumption. You know, we're drowning in marine litter. There is plastic everywhere. You know, the demand for things like uh, traditional medicine or other products that is driving um, poaching in East Africa and, um, and Asia. And those are things that we have to look to ourselves to try to reduce. And we can't just say, well, it is the communities on the ground that may want feathers for their heads dresses, it's actually, it's actually us that need to be thinking about how we live and can we live more sustainably. I think you, you make sure people realise there's a, re a reaction and action to do with us. I, I think there is this connection. But it's harder, isn't it's it harder, it's harder when it's an ant to try and make well, that something people can relate to? Uh, when you take the, you know, the, the, the photo arc that we're talking about, that, that, those wonderful photographs, that's where that, that comes into its own. Yeah. Because if you, if you separate the background, so you demystify everything and just have the ant, in a photograph on a white background, and it's macro shot, you guys know. Well, that's, this is where Will and comes exactly in. Exactly right. Will because Will suddenly can make a hero you, out of an Correct. Act. So um, you, you make those little cat, the, the little guys, the big guys. Yeah. And then we, as an audience, go, go wow, look at, the, look at the beauty of that. Look at its relevance, look at its role. And beyond that, it's, it's part of a system, isn't it? And so and the driver reason. ants, isn't it true yeah. that a colony of driver ants is 40 Circle kilos of, of weight, which will yeah. equal to a small... 20 million strong, yeah. you know, Absolutely. one massive great throbbing... And ether. therefore, the system will fall apart without that little heroic I character think, that you make. I think that project is very clever, like you said, the black and the white background. Yeah. Uh, slightly contrived, but the contrived is for an end purpose, and the purpose is really sort of empowering. And I've seen some of the stuff, and there were some lemurs, and it does some kind of rare stuff. So fascinating. I can't work out if the black or the white background looks better, but I think both look fantastic. But yeah, he's doing a great job, and I don't know how many species he's done, but I think it's his life work, I think. Yeah, Joel's photographed about 6,000 species so far, and he's hoping to photograph 12,000. What he does is he only photographs species that are found in captivity. So part of the, having the background is to take that environment away because obviously they're not in, yeah. in nature. And I think he emphasises the fragility. So, you know, many of these species are on the verge of extinction and we have only a few left. And, and interestingly, by default, if you're saying that he's doing these shots because they are captive animals, by default, it's made them very special photographs. Yeah. Because of the isolation of the animal away yeah. from a background, it's made them extraordinary and exquisite. It's the awareness raising that's really important because how can you um, celebrate and conserve the whole diversity of life if you are only aware of a few species? And what are the animals that are actually most at threat of extinction at the moment? 25% of all mammal species are considered to be endangered by the red list. 40% of amphibians are considered to be endangered, 13% of birds. There aren't any single species that you could necessarily focus on because what's important is the diversity of life. I mean, the difficulty, it seems to me, with a lot of this is just making ordinary people care. It's one thing to watch the programmes and say you love nature. It's another thing to change your behaviour or your government's behaviour so that these things don't happen anymore. And, you know, if you're watching this on your mobile phone at the moment and you're going to work on the train and you've got your frothy cappuccino, now, what is the answer to that question? How, how does it affect me? That coffee that you're drinking is pollinated um, and we need these things. I mean, in the UK alone, pollination is thought to be worth more than £650 million a year. So that's all of the crops that we're eating. Um, and so it is important to us because we don't know, as those extinctions kind of amplify and become more and more, we don't 
know how quickly we'll be driven to losing you know, many, many more species that are providing services that we really depend upon. So it may not affect us immediately, but it will. Okay, well, we're going to have to end the conversation here before we all become extinct. But thank you very much for joining me, uh, Nisha uh, and Adrian and Craig and Benedict and Will. Uh, find out more from us on the week at theweek.co.uk. I've been Ollie Mann, and remember to watch these programmes on Nat Geo Wild when they're on as well. You will, I promise, we've confirmed, be entertained as well as educated. <laughs>